And look, if you think email isn't in trouble, think about how often you've heard somebody say, slide into my inbox. <laughs> the answer is never, you guys. Nobody has ever fucking said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> no one even... No one gives out emails when they want to like. I don't have your email address, Chris. How could I slide into there? <laughs> I've, been, I've never tried to court somebody and been like, let me give you my email address. It's coolguy73. This is an old email address, right? Like, no one ever fucking does that. It's phone numbers or find me on Facebook. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, you are probably going to hear some background laughter in this episode, and that is from real people that are in the virtual audience for this show. Uh, every single Friday, almost every single Friday, uh, I do these shows called the Citizen Revolution Shows, which eventually become episodes of Fork Full of Noodles. Uh, so if you want to be a part of this show, you can do so by grabbing tickets right off of my website for the next one. They happen on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, and tickets are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you can uh, become a sustaining member. You can make a one-time donation. Uh, you can download my albums. You can check out past videos. It's the one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. And uh, by becoming a sustaining member, a big thing that you do is by is help shows like this, help help all of the, the shows that I do, uh, Forkful of Noodles, the Happy Table Talk, the Dispatches, the Road Reflections, everything you see on this channel. And you get free tickets to be a part of the live virtual audience uh, for the Citizen Revolution show. Uh, sustaining members never have to pay for a ticket. They have access to every single show. Uh, so once again, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. Now on to the episode. The Postal Service is a part of making America great by connecting communities, ensuring that we are an informed populace, <laughs> and making sure that we are all taken care of. The Postal Service has been for the public good, and because of that, it's been the target of private interest since the early 20th century. And to really understand why the United States Postal Service is currently in $55 billion worth of debt, we have to go all the way back to 1907. Right, at the top of the century, major bankers like J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller and all everyone in that circle were pushing to centralize America's banking industry so they have more control over the nation's money. So they created a rumor that a prominent bank in New York was failing, which created a panic and an eventual crash. And this was known as the Great Crash of 1907. Now, after that happened, the United States Postal Savings Bank was put into place in 1910 to prevent average citizens from losing everything when the financial system failed. And holy shit, did it fail a lot. Like, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it fails like its job is to fail. You know, like, <laughs> 1907, 1914, 1929, in the 1970s, 2000, 2002, 2008, 2020. Also, in 2021, it'll fail. In 2020, you guys get the point. You guys see where I'm going with this. <laughs> Now, the Postal Savings Bank would be a public bank that would not only help the average working class, but it would also help fund the Postal Service in and of itself. The Postal Service has never been funded by taxpayer money. I mean, come on, why would it, guys? The Postal Service provides a service to the public. It, it's not like it's going out there starting wars in countries we have no business being in. Come on. <laughs> 
Look, when the Postal Service starts killing black and brown people on purpose, then we can start using taxes to fund it. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, exactly. Look, this is America, damn it. Land of freedom and not understanding the Second Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you wanted logic and understanding, then you can go to Canada, people. Okay? Well, good luck getting your mail up there. Now, the Postal Bank would have been one of the largest public banks in the nation, right? And public banks are incredibly helpful since they save the unbanked and the underbanked. 28% of Americans either don't have a bank or access to a bank. And these folks depend on payroll cards that they can use for food or gas, which is similar to scripts, which is currency that the mining corporations use in their towns in the early 1900s. It's basically fake money to control the populace. 10% of Americans' income goes into paying fees, which includes $50 a month in ATM fees. A public postal bank would alleviate a lot of these issues. But in 1910, the largest wealthy bankers tried to centralize the banking industry, were looking to pass the Federal Reserve Act and called the Postal Bank a menace. And after they caused the crash in 1929 and took America off of the gold standard for, for the currency, the Federal Reserve really needed America to, to, to trust centralized banks again, especially over the postal banks. So FDR enacted the FDIC insurance, started putting caps on the postal bank and forced them to increase their interest rate. FDR basically bullied the postal bank by saying, stop indebting yourself, stop indebting yourself, stop indebting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Just by the way, is anyone surprised when a majority of America's problem comes from an overpowered banking industry? <laughs> right, they've, they've kind of become like the obvious villains in every story, haven't they? They're, they're kind of like the team rocket of villainy. <laughs> <laughs> like really bad at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like, oh, are we... Are we all fucked as a nation? Bob, well, okay, there it is. The banking system's here. You know, they have like a theme song and shit. For some reason, they have a talking cat. How do they get a talking cat? They probably paid for it. <laughs> but look, I, I understand the idea of having a bank within the post office sounds weird, right? But the postal bank would be very similar to how something like AAA offers roadside assistance, car insurance, tourism help medical insurance, elderly support, driver's license renewals, cake baking classes, right? Look, if Target and Apple can offer up their own credit card and financial services, then why can't the Postal Service offer a postal bank with better interest rate and customer care? In 2014, the Postmaster General actually made an argument for, for the need for a postal bank, but it fell on deaf ears. Right At that time, Obama was more concerned with the White House Correspondence Center, and the Republicans were more concerned over his tan suit. <laughs> <laughs> a postal bank would provide all the service that most banks provide at a better interest rate and would provide benefits a lot easier and quicker by partnering with various other government agencies. They would also provide retail lending to help small business America grow. Could you imagine the state of small businesses during a pandemic if a public postal bank could approve and grant low interest loans with greater forgiveness and get them that money faster? Holy shit. It'd almost be like we were a logical country that was run on compassion, critical thinking, real empathy, and understanding. It would almost be like if we were Canada. <laughs> America's hat. We're so, we're so close. <laughs> now, after FDR crippled the postal bank, much like polio had, you know, crippled him. <laughs> oh, my God. Dark joke. I know. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Some of the jokes I write, I'm not very proud of. They come from a very, very dark place, deep in my heart. Uh, 
filled with a lot of rage. Anyway, <laughs> after FDR crippled the Postal Bank, uh, Eisenhower took the next step and basically said, no government organization should be in direct competition with private enterprises, and then abolishes the Postal Bank. I mean, this is why we can't have nice things, right? Like, like literally, this is the reason why we can't have nice things. This is the notion that private enterprise needs to grow infinitely instead of steadily. And it's basically the reason why America doesn't have things like universal health care or education, right? It has to be controlled by corporate interests so the spirit of competition can be alive to kick us all in the teeth and then charge us extra for dental. <laughs> Look, have you guys ever have you guys ever played Mario Kart with your friends? You know, like a late night with Mario. Yeah, like it's fun, right? Playing the video games is yeah, it's fun. You you get to compete. There's people are throwing turtle shells and banana peels all over the place, and people slip, and everybody laughs, and it's a really good time. But but then it gets like a little bit too serious, and then five minutes later, your friend is torching your gas tank so you don't beat them to Wendy's. <laughs> 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 that's what capitalism and the spirit of competition is <laughs> it's a torch gas tank and too much fast food <laughs> that's what we're talking about now there were commenters in the 60s back, all the way back in the 60s that were talking about how the postal service should be privatized and there are private entities that do similar things to the postal service right like FedEx and UPX or UPS, not UPX. Uh, cool name though. Uh, but in fact, FedEx though can pretty much do everything that the Postal Service can because the United States Postal Service had to sign away first class mail rights to them. Yeah. Now, there was a little bit of hope for the United States Postal Service under one Richard Milhouse. Nixon. Hmm. I know, I know, but wait for it. Nixon was so terrible that the postal workers went on strike asking for better pay, better hours, and better work conditions. In 1970, the postal workers' average salary was roughly $2,200 a year, which translated to today is about $15,000 a year. And that's just shy of minimum wage, right? It's like seven twenty-one an hour, something along the lines. Now, fortunately, today the uh, a postal worker is making an average of fifteen to twenty dollars an hour, depending on the state that they work in. Plus, the job of a mailman is incredibly grueling, right? You, you guys, like I watch mailmans come up and down. There's no way I'd be able to do that job, right? Try carrying <laughs> sacks of mail. <laughs> up and down the hills of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or San Francisco, <laughs> you know, especially for less than minimum wage, and then tell me where your frame of mind is, right? Mm -hmm. and because of how tough this job is, the turnover rate for the Postal Service in 1970 was 23%. Now, the Postal Service is the second largest employer of American citizens behind Walmart, you know, except people at the Postal Service are like way less dead on the inside. So <laughs> big difference there. They're, they're also the largest employer of African Americans. Now, when the strike happened, when the great postal strike of 1970 happened, it was met with brevity and calm by Richard Nixon. I have just now directed the activation of the men of the various military organizations to begin in New York City the re restoration of essential mail services. New York City is where the current illegal stoppages began. It is where the mail has been halted the longest and it is where the resultant problems have become most acute. If the Postmaster General deems it necessary to act in other affected major cities, I will not hesitate to act. These replacements are being sent in as a supplemental workforce to maintain essential services. Yes, of course, because clearly you need men with guns to handle the mail. Okay? <laughs> Guys, 
you never know when a letter from your booby could explode. Right? <laughs> With, you know, like love and fucking hard candies. It's dangerous shit. <laughs> Project, if it's a Werther's, that's going everywhere. <laughs> right? I mean, guys, <laughs> let's be honest. Why would you pay postal workers better when you can just have armed gunmen attack your mailboxes? <laughs> and then they make sure that you pay your electric bill on time at gunpoint. That just sounds better because it's just, it's more fun. Now, the unions weren't behind the strike, but the rank and file went on strike anyway, right? They walked off and called sick, engaging in one of the largest wildcat strikes of the century. 150,000 letter carriers, in addition to 200,000 other employees, just walked off the job in March of 1970. And Nixon was so hurt by 350,000 postal workers striking that he went on national television asking for some understanding. Essential services must be maintained. And as president, I shall meet my constitutional responsibility to see that those services are maintained. And I'm asking for the understanding and support of every American in this decision that I have made in behalf of our country. Touching, isn't it? Very touching. And look, people were moved by by this. It's a, he's he's very good. He's very good at eliciting some kind of emotion from people. Uh, and and the postal workers were moved by this as well. So they did respond with a message of empathy. And now he can give himself a 100% raise. Congress can give itself a 41% raise, but we can't have nothing. You understand? People that change these light bulbs can get more money than we do. They bring home more money each month than we do. So I can't see why we shouldn't get our money. I think what in essence he said was, you go back to work or else you may jeopardize your job when I send in the troops to replace you. He said nothing about the possibility that he might not veto a pay increase. That is the one thing I wanted to hear. I think that's what most of us wanted to hear. Promises, promises, promises. Nothing's happening. Well, I think, uh, I don't think the people will go back to work until some kind of uh, negotiations are reached, some kind of agreement, because they're sick of this. The second to last person was my favorite. I liked her a lot. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I like what she promises, promises, promises. I'm like, yeah, that's how I feel, lady. You nailed it. Way to go. You're like my spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> So why was Nixon fighting so desperately to get the mail out there, right? Because this was during the Vietnam War, which meant no draft notices, because all the draft notices were sent out by mail. No draft notices means no soldiers, means no wars, and that means no erections for Nixon. (laughs) (laughs) And if there are no erections for Nixon, Nixon, then how were him and Henry Kissinger supposed to show off their special no-pants hug at the White House briefings? <laughs> yeah. This was the time before Viagra, and I am not sorry that I put that image in your head. <laughs> because I'm living with it too, you guys. <laughs> Everybody will share my pain. Anyway. <laughs> now... The strike ended with Nixon giving collective bargaining rights to the Postal Service, but denied them the right to strike. This happened a lot in the later half of the uh, the 20th century, right? They would offer uh, workers the the right to collectively bargain, but not give them the right to strike. They were trying to make strikes illegal. But they did add a compulsory arbitration, which was required if a settlement through collective bargaining was not achieved. Essentially, they began running the Postal Service like it was a corporation instead of a public service, which it is, right? And 
this isn't particularly a major win for the po postal service, but it's not a total loss either, right? Which is weird because I feel like Richard Nixon gave them like a solid neutral. That's basically what he did. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in 2006, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act is responsible for the Postal Service being in debt. Following uh, un a, a, under Obama, uh, following the, the passing of the bill under Obama, sorting and trucking were subcontracted and 65,000 postal workers lost their job. And this is triple whammy from the fact that this was at the height of email, which is now slowly being destroyed by Facebook Messenger and Twitter DMs. <laughs> and look, if you think email isn't in trouble, think about how often you've heard somebody say, slide into my inbox. <laughs> the answer is never, you guys. Nobody has ever fucking said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> no one even... No one gives out emails when they want to like. I don't have your email address, Chris. How could I slide into there? <laughs> I've, been, I've never tried to court somebody and been like, let me give you my email address. It's coolguy73. This is an old email address, right? Like, no one ever fucking does that. It's phone numbers or find me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> But the internet did provide the postal service with its saving graces too, right? Most packages from online retailers were going through the post office. Now, this means that they needed new equipment to sort and deliver these packages, but it was another opportunity for private industry to strike again. Companies like Amazon have gotten into shipping and creating their own delivery service, and the postal service is getting hamstrung by how it can generate income. They can only sell stamps, passport services, and mail-related items. But companies like FedEx and UPS can sell mail-related items and retail goods. And look, if you're sending a package, do you really need a Kit Kat at that moment? This oh, rampant, <laughs> yeah, but look, this rampant need to snack every 10 minutes is also destroying the postal service. Maybe I do need a snack, damn it, I'm fat. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. You can send that letter without a snack. I believe in you. I believe in don't you, you. Don't you body shame me. No fat shaming here. <laughs> <laughs> do it for the Postal Service. I'm just trying to help. I'm just trying to be a patriot, damn it. <laughs> Look, Republicans have harshly said that the Postal Service doesn't deserve funding because it's an inefficient business. But how can it work effectively if all of the legislation written by Democrats and Republicans are meant to stifle the service? That's like taking your car to the mechanic to get an oil change, and then they shoot the engine and claim you're a bad driver. <laughs> <laughs> From the abolition of the public postal bank, stripping away its, their right to strike, and all the way to pre-funding retirement for 75 years, the Postal Service has been a target of private interests for, the, for over 100 years, right? When you have a public service that delivers our food, medicine, consumer goods, the bills we all try to avoid by changing our addresses and moving to a different state and hoping that the Postal Service doesn't find us, oh, but they find you. Oh, but they find you. As, as well as our ballots and our information the oligarchy will do everything in its power to bring that service to its knees and ensure that the working class remains in poverty and debt. The Postal Service can be saved if it's allowed to do what it's intended to do. Right? Reversing all of the restrictive regulations would be a start. Giving the service the funding it needs and deserves would be another. Providing our mail carriers with the pay and benefits they deserve would also be huge. And look, it's about damn time that we started preserving American institutions like the United States Postal Service and dismantling unconstitutional ones like the centralized banking system that is pretty much the villain in every story.
And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, please give it a like. Please give it a share. Uh, and uh, make sure that you are subscribed to my channel, whether you're watching this on Facebook, whether you're watching this on my website, whether you are watching this on the YouTubes or on Rockfin. Uh, if you're watching this on Rockfin.com, awesome. You are part of the blockchain cryptocurrency ad-free site which acts like Netflix for content creators, where for $10 a month, you get all of the premium content from all of the content creators that are on Rockfin. Content creators like Ron Placone, Graham Elwood, Jimmy Dore. Uh, you got Kim Iverson, Nico House, The Convo Couch, and so, so many more, uh, including myself. So if you are tired of the, the mainstream uh, content creation sites like YouTube and Facebook, then head on over to Rockfin and follow me there. Become a subscriber. Uh, if you can. If not, that's totally cool too. Uh, you can find all of my stuff available right on my website, uh, krishmohanhaha.com, which is the one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. Uh, past episodes of this show, you can get tickets for my live virtual stand-up comedy shows uh, and the actual live shows when touring starts back up again. Um, not only that, but you can also go to the donate page and become a sustaining Member. Sustaining members get uh, additional stand-up comedy content and free tickets to the live virtual stand-up comedy shows. So if you want to do that and if you have the funds to do that, I hope that you do. Uh, and uh, uh, once again, the website is krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next